All right, welcome back to ABA exam review and the continuation of our sixth edition BCBA task list series. We're continuing concepts and principles with B8, unconditioned, conditioned, and generalized punishers. This is going to be very similar to our reinforcement video because they're essentially the same ideas, except of course one has to do with reinforcement and one has to do with punishment. We're still building on our principles as we move closer and closer to the more complex topics. As always, we're gonna break this down into what we think are the essential bits of information you need for your exam. Be sure to check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials, including our combo pack. When you pass your exam, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Please subscribe if you aren't already for all of our video updates. We post three BCBA videos a week in addition to our RBT content. As always, Work hard, study hard, let's get going. Let's start here. Punishers decrease the likelihood of a behavior occurring in the future. Whenever you're dealing with a consequence question, whenever you're determining consequences in a real life situation, you're always looking at how that consequence is influencing future behavior. So if we have our antecedent, our behavior, and our consequence, that consequence is going to impact what happens to that behavior in the future. If that behavior goes up, we're dealing with reinforcement. If that behavior goes down, it's gonna be punishment or extinction. That is set in stone. We can't change that. No matter what the topography is of the consequence, if the behavior increases, it's reinforcement. If it goes down, it's extinction or punishment. Now, when dealing with punishers, we can have unconditioned, conditioned, or generalized punishers. Unconditioned punishers require no prior learning. Think pain, right? Touching heat or a hot stove is no prior learning needed when you're in pain. Conditioned punishers or conditioned punisher are created through pairing. So we take, let's say, that unconditioned punisher of pain from touching the oven, and we pair it with, let's say, a reprimand. No, don't do that. Now we're conditioning that reprimand to be punishing in itself. And then generalized punishers maintain effectiveness across different situations through multiple pairings. So again, very, very similar to our reinforcement video and our reinforcement item, but obviously reinforcement and punishment do different things. So we've got to go through it again. Now, starting with unconditioned punishers, also known as primary punishers, they're inherently aversive and decrease behavior without prior learning. Typically, punishers will be aversive, but of course we know consequences are all about how it influences behavior, not necessarily topography. But in general, you can think of punishers as aversive, especially unconditioned punishers, because no prior experience is needed to function as a punisher or as punishment. Typically, they're linked to some sort of biological significance, same as our unconditioned reinforcement. When we think of things like food or shelter or water, we need these things, right, biologically, innately. We're going to seek those out given enough time. Primary punishers, we're typically going to try to avoid punishment whenever possible. Cold, extreme cold, extreme heat, uh, not having enough food, being hungry. These are primary punishers that we're gonna to try to avoid because biologically we're programmed to not want to engage with those punishers. If we do engage with those consequences, they typically will punish some sort of behavior. So again, some examples, extreme temperatures, pain, and loud noises. Now be careful here. I always tell you how important fluency is on every single task list item, but what you don't wanna do is overcomplicate something like unconditioned punishment. It's not that difficult of a topic. So we're going in depth here, but don't overcomplicate what unconditioned punishment is. Same thing with conditioned punishment or a conditioned punisher or secondary punishers. They acquire aversive properties through association with unconditioned or previously conditioned punishers. Essentially, we're just pairing them together, right? So if we have an unconditioned punisher and a neutral stimulus, we can pair those and create a conditioned punisher. If we have a conditioned punisher and a, a conditioned punishment and a neutral stimulus, we can create a conditioned punisher. That's how pairing works, right? Just like with 
respondent conditioning, we can pair stimuli to make them punishers. That's why things like reprimands or a pretty common approach is to count to three, right? If I get to three, we're going to time out. After enough pairing, all you have to do is start counting one, two, and that's going to be punishing enough for the learner. That's typically how condition punishment or pairing works. So effectiveness is created through learning history and pairing. As an analyst, you want to think about learning history nonstop. In practice, I think about learning history more than anything else. What happened five years ago? What happened a year ago? What happened yesterday in this person's history that may be influencing them today? It can vary based on the individual. We never focus on topography. Just like reinforcement, just because I give somebody a piece of chocolate cake, I can't just call it a reinforcer unless it changes the behavior. So I can't just put somebody in timeout and call it a punisher. You've got to think of what is the effect of that consequence, not necessarily what it looks like or if it's preferred or aversive. For example, a reprimand may become a conditioned punisher if consistently paired with loss of privileges. So if loss of privileges is our conditioned punisher and our reprimand is our neutral stimulus, if we pair those together, we can create a conditioned punisher. And then generalized punishers are a type of conditioned punisher that have been paired with multiple other punishers, making them effective in various contexts, just like generalized reinforcement. Multiple pairings give them value outside of just one context. We're less dependent on specific conditions for effectiveness, meaning we don't necessarily need motivating operations in place. We don't need a lot of setting events in place for the punishers to be effective because they've been paired with so many things that chances are they still function as punishment regardless of the condition. They can remain effective across different settings and people, which can be very important because with punishment, we want to deliver punishment immediately continuously and at the highest magnitude possible. So we want that punishment to be effective as frequently as possible. So for example, social disapproval is often considered a very strong punisher and it's typically paired with multiple other punishers. You can pair social disapproval with a lot of different things, making it a pretty good generalized punisher. If we compare that to something like social praise, which is a pretty good generalized reinforcer, Think about everything that praise can be paired with. Same as social disapproval. So all these generalized punishers are paired with a lot of other punishers, making them effective in various contexts. Key takeaways. Unconditioned punishers are often naturally aversive and require no prior learning, typically at a biological level. Conditioned punishers gain their effect through association with other punishers, so taking Neutral stimuli and pairing them with punishers can create conditioned punishers. Generalized punishers are effective across multiple settings and conditions because of repeated pairings. Understanding the distinction is crucial for effective, crucial for effective and ethical behavior reduction strategies. We're always going to talk about ethical behavior reduction when dealing with punishment because punishment requires ongoing monitoring, always being aware of how punishment is affecting the client both behaviorally and are we dealing with any sort of emotional setback? Are we creating aversive uh, technicians or pairing people with punishment? We've got to consider a lot of ethical ideas behind punishers, which is why it's so important to understand the different types, types of punishers, such as unconditioned versus conditioned. And then always remember to monitor and fade punishment quickly and to remain ethical. Thanks for watching. Again, Pretty straightforward concept. Let's not overcomplicate it, but let's not ignore it either. The worst thing you can do is ignore these quote unquote easy ideas because you want to get to the harder stuff. You've got to have the foundations and you've got to be fluent in everything. Please subscribe if you aren't already. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials. When you pass, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. See you soon.